Before today's video, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on the latest videos. If you want to see a case or topic covered by Paranormally Listed, then go to criminallylisted.com and fill out the questionnaire under the Suggest a Case tab. Number 3. The Curse of the Knights Templar The Knights Templar was an organization that was formed in the 1100s. They were an exclusive society that many people wanted to join. They were involved in the Crusades in the Middle East and created a financial system. They gained respect and admiration in much of the Christian population of Europe. However, a series of unfortunate events led to the destruction of their organization. The first involves the city of Akko in Israel. During the Crusades, they had power over the city, but they lost control of it in 1291. By the year 1302, they did not control any city in the Middle East. This made people think that they were less powerful than they used to be. The King of France, Philip IV, did not like the Knights Templar and saw their winning popularity as a way to control them. But we'll get to that in a few moments. First, we must tell you about the last Grand Master of the Knights Templar, Jacques de Molay. Jacques de Molay was born around the 1240s or 1250s. He was only 21 when he became a knight and eventually became the 23rd and ultimately the final Grand Master of the Order of the Knights Templar. He started this position on April 20th, 1292. Many people believe that the Knights Templar had some secret treasure during this period. There was a belief around the Knights Templar that they were extremely rich and while they were in the Middle East during the Crusades, they found the treasure of King Solomon. French King Philip IV thought it would serve him if the Knights Templar and another group of Knights, the Knights Hospitaller, joined together in one group. Then King Philip IV would oversee the group. The King's problem was that he borrowed money from the Knights Templar because ongoing wars were bleeding him dry. He could not pay them back. The King's dislike of the Knights Templar was also a matter of loyalty. The Knights Templar pledged their allegiance to the Pope and not the King. Ultimately, the King's plans didn't work. Instead, he got Pope Clement V to help him arrest the members of the Knights Templar and charge them with heresy. Some of the accusations against the Knights were that they were disrespectful of religion and that they worked with the devil. King Philip also wanted all the wealth they cured over the years delivered to the royal treasury. The Knights Templars were all arrested in 1307 and tortured. They all gave false confessions due to being tortured. Over the next seven years they were imprisoned and tortured. During this time Jacques de Molay, the Grand Master, rescinded his confession but it didn't matter. It was decided by the Catholic Cardinals that the Knights, including de Molay, would be burned at the stake. On March 18, 1314, de Molay and the rest of the Knights Templar were burned alive. It's believed that de Molay was about 70 years old when he was executed. But the other night, the Priors were set to burn quickly to quicken their death so that they wouldn't suffer for long. They decided not to grant de Molay that privilege. They wanted him to die a slow, painful death. As de Molay was being executed, he unleashed a curse. He cursed everyone involved in his death. Of course, this included King Philip IV and Pope Clement V. But he also cursed the king's children and just about anyone who had anything to do with him currently burning to death. He did not want the king's family to rule France anymore. He also prayed that it would come to light that he and all his men were innocent and that justice would be served. The flames then consumed Jacques de Molay. On April 20th, 1314, a month after de Molay and the other Knights Templars were executed, Pope Clement V died of natural causes. He was about 49 or 50 years old. That night his body was kept in a church. The church was struck by lightning and it caught fire. The Pope's body was destroyed. Seven months later, on November 29, 1314, King Phil IV died at age 46. It's believed he died of a stroke. Right before his death, he discovered that two of his daughter-in-laws were having affairs with two knights. 
the knights died a horrific death. There's a lot of debate about how they died. What is known is that they were castrated. Then they were either broken on the wheel or flayed alive and then hanged. Other historians believe after they were castrated, they were drawn and quartered. Whatever happened, the executions were so horrifying that they shocked the king and it's believed that they contributed to his death. The daughter-in-laws were imprisoned for life. Between 1314 and 1328 or 1329, the three sons of the king all died. All of them had short reigns as king before their deaths. None of them had children, so it was the end of the house Capet. Interestingly, Pope Clement V absolved Jacques de Molay and the rest of the Knights Templar in 1308, only a year after their arrests and false confessions. This was six years before they were put to death and the curse was unleashed. The fact that the Pope absolved the Knights Templars was only discovered in 2001 when Barbara Frail, an Italian paleographer of the Vatican's secret archives, found a document called the Chinon Parchment. The document says that three cardinals interviewed the knights and returned to the Pope with their findings. This led to the Pope absolving them. In June 2011, Pope Benedict XVI issued an apology for the execution of the Knights Templar. He even addressed that Pope Clement V knew what he was doing at the time was wrong, but he did it anyway. Regardless of why Pope Clement V did what he did, he certainly paid the price when he died shortly after the curse was supposedly unleashed. Number 2. Curse of the Hope Diamond If you saw the 1997 mega smash hit film, Titanic, there was a beautiful blue diamond necklace called the Heart of the Ocean. The Hope Diamond inspired it. It's believed that the diamond came from the Kohler mine in Golconda, India, because many colored diamonds have been found there. Around 1666 or 1667, Jean-Baptiste Travenier, who was a jeweler, traveler, and storyteller, went to India and came into possession of a large blue diamond that was 112 and 316th carat. There are a couple stories about how he came into possession of the diamond. One was that he stole it from the Indian idol of the Hindu goddess Sita. The diamond was used as one of her eyes. Another version is that he got it from a rogue priest. Either way, this is the curse's origin. The priest supposedly cursed anyone who was in possession of the diamond. Travenier brought the blue diamond back with him to France. In the late 1660s, he sold it to King Louis XIV. He sold the diamond for 220 livres, far less than it was worth. It was probably worth double that. However, Travenier was granted a patent of nobility at the same time, which was worth around 400,000 to 500,000 livres. It seemed that Travenier was set for life. But, according to some sources, it didn't turn out that way. He was supposedly torn to pieces by wild dogs. After King Louis XIV purchased the diamond, he called it the Blue Diamond of the Crown and French Blue. Marquis de Montspan was a mistress of the king and he let her wear the diamond. But in 1691, she fell out of favor with the king who was exiled. Nicolas Fouquet was a superintendent of finances in France, and the king liked him immensely. The king allowed Fouquet to wear the diamond. But soon after, the king accused him of embezzlement and sent him to prison for the rest of his life. In 1715, King Louis XIV died at age 76 of gangrene. His great-grandson, Louis XV, became king at age 5. He reigned until he died in 1774. Then, his grandson, Louis XVI, became king and inherited the Blue Diamond. Louis XVI and his wife, Marie Antoinette, ruled during a turbulent time in France. The people were unhappy with the monarchy, which led to the French Revolution. In the lead-up to the revolution, serious economic problems occurred and everyday citizens were starving. But the royal family lived in luxury. Marie Thérèse de Louise de Sauvignon Cagignon, Princess de Lamballe, was a companion of Marie Antoinette and she had worn the diamond. 
In September 1792, she was torn apart by a murderous crowd. In 1791, King Louis XVI and Queen Marie Antoinette tried to flee France, but they were caught. They were both beheaded in 1793. Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette were the last king and queen of France. During a period called the Reign of Terror, the diamond was being stored in the Crown Furniture Storage and someone figured out a way to steal from there undetected. One item that was stolen was the blue diamond. Eventually, someone realized that some of the items had been stolen. Some of the items were recovered, but the blue diamond was not. It's believed that it was handed off to Dutch jeweler Wilhelm Falls. He supposedly recut the diamond. There are two stories about what happened to the diamond while it was in Wilhelm's possession. One story is that his son, Henrik, murdered him and stole the diamond. Another is that after Henrik stole the diamond, Wilhelm died of a broken heart. After Henrik got the diamond, he sold it and lived a life of debauchery. In 1830, he took his own life. He had sold the diamond to diamond merchant Francois Ballou. Ballou became destitute in the years after gaining the diamond. He sold it on his deathbed to English jeweler Daniel Ellison. Ballou died the next day. Twenty years later, Daniel Ellison tried to sell the blue diamond in London. The diamond's whereabouts became public just as the statute of limitations on the theft of the diamond had expired. It's believed that Ellison sold it to the King of England, George IV. There's no record of King George IV buying it, but there are secondary sources like news writings and artwork depicting him wearing the diamond. The king died in debt without any legitimate heirs to claim his throne. Since he was in debt, the diamond was sold to Henry Philip Hope to pay off his debts. His ownership led to his current name, the Hope Diamond. Henry Philip Hope was a wealthy man and heir to a banking firm called Hope and Company. According to PBS, Henry Philip's Hope, only child, died before him. His three nephews inherited his fortune but Henry did not give directions on splitting up his jewel collection. After 10 years of fighting, the diamond went to Henry Thomas Hope. When Henry Thomas died, the Hope diamond went to his mother. When she died, it went to her grandson, Lord Francis Hope. In 1894, Lord Francis married American showgirl, May Yohi. Lord Francis Hope had a gambling problem and lost all his money. To help himself financially, he wanted to sell the diamond. But to sell it, he had to get permission from his siblings. They did not want him to sell it. He took the matter to court in 1898 and 1899, and the court told him he could not sell it. It was only in 1901 that the court agreed to allow him to sell it. Lord Francis and May Yohi divorced a year after the diamond was sold. Yohi had been having an affair. She married that man, but the marriage ended after a year. Yohi blamed her problems on the curse of the diamond. American jeweler Simon Frankel purchased the diamond in 1901. In 1907, there was a financial crisis, and Frankel found himself in financial trouble, so he sold the diamond. For a short time, the diamond was in the hands of jeweler Jacques Coulot. He supposedly went insane and died by suicide. It then went to Russian Prince Ivan Kanikovsky. He let his romantic partner, Neil Laurence Ledoux, wear it. Supposedly, Kanikovsky murdered her. Russian revolutionaries then killed Kanikovsky. The diamond then found its way to Simon Mosheraz, a Greek jeweler. He was driving in the car with his wife and nine-year-old daughter. He drove into a precipice and the family was killed. The diamond then ended up in the hands of the Sultan of Turkey, Abdul Hamid II. He had an expert, Abu Sabir, polish the diamond. Soon after, Sabir was imprisoned and tortured. Zubaydah was the Sultan's favorite concubine. He supposedly let her wear the diamond. Soon after, she was killed by a jealous concubine. The Sultan was also doomed. 
Not long after getting the diamond, he was deposed. He was the last Turkish sultan to have absolute power. After he was dethroned, one of his eunuchs, Shavir Eka, stole the diamond. He was caught and hanged for the offense. A supporter of the sultan, Kalub Bey, stuck the diamond out of the country. It's believed that he took it to France. Bey then returned to Turkey and gave the sultan the proceeds for the sale. Afterwards, Bey was caught by a Turkish mob and hanged. It was purchased in Paris by Salim Habib, a Turkish diamond collector. He paid $400,000 for it, but he fell into financial trouble and wanted to sell it. At an auction, the highest bid was $80,000, so he rescinded the sale. In November 1909, Salim Habib was aboard a French steamer in Singapore. The boat went down and Habib was killed. It was thought that the diamond was with him and that the diamond was lost. But was actually in possession of French jeweler Pierre Cartier. In 1912, he was trying to sell the diamond to American socialite and mining heiress Evelyn Walsh McLean. McLean's husband was heir to the publishing empire that owned the Washington Post and the Cincinnati Inquirer. But McLean didn't seem interested in buying it. While they talked, McLean said that she knows some items that were considered bad luck by some actually brought her good luck. Cartier then told her about the curse connected to the diamond. After some consideration, she ended up buying the diamond. For eight years, there were no problems. But then, in 1919, her nine-year-old son died in a car crash. In 1933, the family was suffering financial hardship. They ended up selling the Washington Post. McLean's husband had an affair and left her. He was later committed to a mental health institution where he remained until his death. In 1946, McLean's 25-year-old daughter died either by taking her own life or due to a drug overdose. The following year, Evelyn Walsh McLean died at age 60. She was in debt when she died, so the diamond was sold to cover her debts. The last individual to own the diamond was Harry Winston. He decided to donate it to the Smithsonian Institution in 1958. However, that didn't end the curse. Winston decided to mail the diamond to the Smithsonian. He paid $145.29 for a million dollars in insurance. James Todd, the mailman who delivered the diamond to the Smithsonian, suffered a series of unfortunate events within a year of delivering it. First, his wife died. Then his leg was crushed in a truck accident. In another auto accident, he injured his head. His dog died after it was strangled on a leash in a freak accident. Finally, his house caught fire and was partially destroyed. The Hope Diamond is on permanent exhibition at the Smithsonian. Number 1. The Pharaoh's Curse In 1922, British archaeologist Howard Carter found the tomb of Pharaoh Tutankhamun in Egypt. The tomb was in the area called the Valley of the Kings. Tutankhamun died over 3,200 years earlier in 1323 BC, and he was only around 18 years old when he passed away. The opening of the tomb began on November 4, 1922. The burial chamber was full of religious objects, paintings, and objects that would serve two to common in the afterlife. This was an exciting find because it was one of the first pharaoh tombs that robbers hadn't already pillaged. Only about six weeks after the tomb was opened, the press started speculating that they had unleashed a curse. Arthur Conan Doyle, creator of Sherlock Holmes, speculated that the curse was to protect the pharaoh. Soon, people involved in the excavation started dying and suffering other misfortunes. 56-year-old George Herbert, also known as Lord Carnarvon, financed the excavation and was in attendance when they first entered the tomb. On April 5, 1923, five months after the tomb was opened, he died in Cairo. He got blood poisoning after he cut open a mosquito bite while he was shaving. One of the first members to enter the tomb was Hugh Evelyn Whiteley. A music teacher, Helen Mary Nidd, was in love with Evelyn White 
but he did not feel the same way. She wrote a letter to him, saying that she was going to kill herself. He replied that if she were to continue to communicate with him in such a manner, he would contact the police. She ended up poisoning herself in a hotel room in Leeds. There was an inquest, and Evelyn White was called to testify. As the 40-year-old Egyptologist was taking a taxi to the inquest, he shot himself in the taxi and died from his injury. The note he allegedly left behind reads, I have succumbed to a curse which forces me to disappear. In 1824, after the pharaoh's body was brought to London, he was x-rayed by Sir Archibald Douglas Reed. 53-year-old Reed got sick just the next day and died three days later. Arthur Mace was on the excavation team. While working on the excavation, he developed a lung condition called pleurisy, which eventually became pneumonia. He was forced to leave the team. Four years later, he supposedly died of arsenic poisoning. He was 53 years old. Reports differ, but Richard Bethwell was Howard Carter or Lord Carvon's secretary. In 1828, there was a series of mysterious fires in his home where some of the artifacts from the tomb were stored. In November 1929, Bethel was in a gentleman's club in London. The 46-year-old was found dead in his bed. It's believed he was murdered by being smothered to death. Sir Bruce Ingham was friends with Carter, but was not on the excavation team. Carter gifted him a paperweight, which was a mummified hand. The hand had a bracelet that reportedly read, Curse be who moves my body. Surringham's house burned down. After he rebuilt it, the house was destroyed by a flood. Other people who just visited the tomb also met with tragic ends. This includes Egyptian aristocrat Ali Kamil Fami Bey. In 1923, the 23-year-old man was fatally shot by his wife in Paris, France. Sir Lee Stack, 56-year-old Governor General of Sudan, visited the tomb and he was assassinated in Cairo in 1924. Financier, 59-year-old George J. Gould, visited the tomb in 1923. Months later, he died of pneumonia. Where did this curse come from? Well, there's a warning sign under the Anubis statue in the tomb. Anubis is the god of the dead, and his presence there is the guard of the body. But the warning sign is supposed to stop grave robbers from stealing, and it is not a curse. In 1923, novelist Marie Corelli wrote an article for the Daily Express. She claimed she was in possession of a rare book that states, The most dire punishment follows any rash intruder into a sealed tomb. She also said that the book stated, Divers secret poisons enclosed in the boxes in such wise that they who touch them shall not know how they come to suffer. Egyptologist Dominic Montserrat said that the idea of the mummy's curse was present even before the excavation of King Tutankhamun's tomb. He said that there was a play in the 1820s in which the wrappings of a real mummy were removed. Ultimately, there may be a scientific explanation for why so many people died following their visit to the tomb. There may have been mold on King Tutankhamun's body and wrappings which circulated in the air. This could have impacted the health of the people who entered the tomb. Of course, this does not explain all the misfortunes of the people connected to the tomb. Ultimately, there may be no rational explanation for the Pharaoh's curse. Thank you so much for watching this video. We hope you found it interesting. If you did find it interesting, please make sure you subscribe. We'll have a new video about the paranormal every week. If you just discovered this channel, please make sure you check out our other channel, Criminally Listed. We have over 325 videos featuring bizarre but true crime stories. You can find it at youtube.com slash criminallylisted. We also have a podcast about cold cases that were eventually solved called Criminally Listed Presents Into the Killing. You can find it on Stitcher, Spotify, Amazon Music, and anywhere you find great podcasts. But that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.